David's already said uh, that we've uh, had some success. I started the company in Copenhagen in 2012. We became a certified B Corporation in 2019. Uh, and that really uh, kind of accelerated our uh, commitment to, uh, to reduce our footprint. Um, now, some of you may be wondering who the hell is this hunky, bearded, sustainability Viking uh, with a genius business idea and an exceptional grasp of English. And I'll be happy to disappoint you. I am, in fact, a child of 90s London capitalism. I grew up in the advertising agency world during that decade, selling everything from credit cards to Korean cars. In my late 20s, I thought I had everything. On a superficial level, I was tremendously fulfilled. In fact, I used to jokingly tell my friends, in the great ocean of life, you can find me in the shallow end. <laughs> <laughs> but there was something missing, a gap a hole in my soul that I couldn't really work out how to close, but it got bigger and bigger. And I knew I had to do something about it. I knew I had to do something that would relate to being master of my own destiny and doing something more purposeful than what I was doing in London. And then I met and fell in love with this blonde Scandinavian girl on the other side of the world at the turn of the millennium in Sydney, Australia. A trainee doctor, an organic gardener, and she took me back to her region, a region I'd never gone to visit before, never planned to visit before, and yet always had some kind of vaguely strange positive associations with it. Because after all, unlike Russia, it's <laughs> one of the few regions on earth where it's universally accepted to say positive things about it. People nod their heads in agreement. And so when we went there, Initially, I had to fall back on my capitalist tendencies, and I started again working for Uncle Sam, advertising agencies, culminating in my job as the Nordic marketing director for McDonald's, selling hamburgers to 25 million Scandinavians. During that period, though, I traveled a lot of the region. Uh, I met a lot of franchisees. I visited 500 uh, restaurants across Scandinavia, I've, I went to parts of Scandinavia that most Scandinavians haven't been, let alone any foreigners. And I started to pick up what I understood to be what really truly did indeed make Scandinavia so different, so special, and such a reference for the rest of the world. And once I'd been able to, thought I was able to capture this, I thought I need to find a way to tell that story to the rest of the world so they can understand it too, because it's the secret of a better life. It's all based on a balance, okay? It's a balance with nature, a balance within society, and a balance of the individual. And I wanted to find a way to tell that story. So 10 years ago, I started Scandinavis. And of course, it had to start with candlelight. Because candlelight makes a moment softer. It brings people together. It creates uh, a fellowship, intimacy. And of course, the Scandinavians do burn more candles than any other nation on earth. That's a, that's a statistical uh, fact. So it was the perfect way to start. And then I decided to use fragrance because I could take people to different parts of Scandinavia through sensory experiences. And thus, Scandinavia was born back in 2012. And I stand here before you today, nearly a full 10 years in, coming up to our decade anniversary. So when I was uh, invited by Emma and Claire to come and speak at Mav Makers and Mavericks, Firstly, I was extremely flattered uh, to be here. Um, and then I thought, and then I understood the, uh, the, uh, the theme, uh, we're all gonna make it. I immediately knew what I wanted to talk about. And it was actually something I'd been working on in a notepad for more than six years of that journey. It's, it's, it's observations on my thought processes and how I've been able to manage my mind in order to to bring my business to life and to continue uh, uh, developing. Because if any of you are founders, if any of you are business owners, if any of you are makers, mavericks, you'll probably almost certainly agree with me that uh, the, the one thing you think about more than anything else in your entire life is your business. It dominates your thoughts morning, noon, and night. You never have a day off because you're always thinking about your business. 
I remember being here at Do Wales three years ago and there was that American ultra marathon runner and he said something I'll never forget. He said, it's 90% mental and the rest is in your head. <laughs> your thoughts can make your idea a massive success, but they can also destroy it. And I was very aware of that because I can't stop my thoughts from racing. So I thought I have to find a way to create some kind of framework, some kind of structure for how to manage this, because otherwise it, I, I won't make it through. Uh, so this is what I'm going to present to you today. I've never presented it before. It's been a kind of very private thing, but I figured for the, for the theme and for the people here, it might be quite useful. Now I'm going to have the difficult task of writing and talking into a microphone. So let's see how it goes. It's called the six Ps of the mind. I gave it a title after I spoke to Claire. The six Ps of the mind. Now some of you are probably going, ah, oh, the six Ps, I've heard those ones before. <laughs> yes, you probably have. And of course it was inspired by the famous six Ps of marketing that have been around for two or three decades or more. And if, if you're like me, they're drilled into your head and they're exceptionally important, priceless uh, methods to, to manage your business. For those of you who don't know, I'm going to remind us all of the six pieces of, ma of marketing, not least because it's probably the first and last time they'll ever be presented here at the uh, Hyatt Denim. I'm going to have to put the microphone down. Six pieces of marketing. In fact, I'll tell you what, what, I want you to call them out for me. What's the first P of marketing? Someone said product, did they? Product. Let's take product. I'm going to put that there. Product. Anyone else? Price, price, yes. Promotion, yeah. I'm just, place, I heard place, good one, place. You, what, there's a big one you've forgotten at the top there. No. People, thank you very much. People, people. And what do all five of those things supposed to deliver for you? Profit. Profit. Thank you. Profit. Now, there was a secret seventh P that came in much later. It was non-obligatory, but it did make you good, look good in presentations. Do you know what that seventh P was? No, but it's a good one too. <laughs> Planet. Planet. But it wasn't obligatory, so we can forget about that one. <laughs> People make product in a certain place, they price it, and then they promote it, and they make a profit. These are all fantastic, so please remember those, because there's probably far better than the rest of the stuff I'm going to talk to you about. But this, these are also all tangible, physical manifestations of thought. It doesn't belittle them, but it means if you got to the place you're actually thinking about those, then you've transferred what's inside your head into something tangible. And what I really want to do and talk about today is what's going on inside my head and possibly some of yours too. The six P's of the mind. I'm going to start with the first P. God, it's been a while since I've written on a whiteboard. That says picture. <laughs> picture. What's the picture in your head of, of the physical manifestation, the end result of your idea? I know you'll have it. Uh, uh, what does it look like? When do you think mission accomplished? You know, because that's what you think it can turn into. Do you want to be a Nobel Prize winner? Do you want a billion users? Do you want the most downloaded app on App Store? Do you want to retire when you're 40? Do you want the biggest house in Britain? You know, what is your picture? It can be intensely personal and it's not necessarily your company's purpose. I would argue that your picture is actually more motivating to you than the rest. It's what, it's what will drive you. And I'll tell you my picture for Scandinavis. Picture me, I'm standing in a pedestrianized street. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of stores. There's a glass, a glass walled store. Inside I can see white walls. I can see uh, delicate shelves with small colored beautiful looking products, all very understated. When I open the door, I can go in and I can see this stripped pine floor. Over in the corner, there's a couple of uh, um, leather couches. One's a sofa and one's a 
uh, an armchair with a little bit of coffee, uh, coffee table there. Obviously a place to sit and talk uh, and read. And then there's two people standing there. Uh, one's a guy, one's a girl. They're both Scandinavian. Not very radical, is it? Uh, I am a child of 90s London capitalism. The difference is that's in Tokyo, Japan, and it's always been in Tokyo, Japan. And when, they cut, when people come into that store, those two Scandinavians speak fluent Japanese because they've lived there for years, uh, and now they are become franchisees or joint venture partners of a, of a company called Scandinavis, which ultimately promotes them to the, in, in the places that they're at. That's my picture. What's yours? The second one is path. What path, or more importantly, what paths do you wish to choose to follow to get to your picture? I did Duke of Edinburgh's award when I was a teenager at school. You get your backpack, you get your map, you get your compass, you plan your route 50 miles in four days, and you wake up on the first morning and it's so foggy, you can't even see the path. So you don't even know which way to go from the very beginning. You get on a path, and after about two hours, you realize this isn't actually a path, or you realize it's the wrong path, or you realize it's too hard, or it's actually too easy, or the path that you've chosen to go on is actually so full of other people, you're not kind of going down anything interesting anyway. I have changed countlessly the times of the paths that I've chosen to take to get to my picture. My product strategy, my distribution strategy, my market focus. I was never going to do a fragrance brand. Uh, what's your path? In the words of one of the advertising gurus that I'm sure David probably knows as well, I'll never forget when he said, when he was actually trying to sell one campaign against another one, he said, you can, you can choose the safe path and take a risk, or you can follow the risky path and play it safe. What's your path? Third P. Permission. If you're on this journey, you've got to give yourself permission to be vulnerable. I was in, in my early 40s, having kind of reached the top of advertising and marketing, and I would walk into uh, design stores around Europe with a bag of candles under my arm, and I'd walk up to the counter and ask to see the manager. And I'd ask them if they would consider stocking our brand. It's some of them, one of the most humbling experiences I did. But it was essential. You've got to leave your ego at the door. Permission to be vulnerable. You've also got to make sure that you let go of all the thoughts that are going on in your head. And you can have somebody you trust, whether it's your partner, your parent, your mentor, your accountant, your lawyer. All of the above, it doesn't really matter, but sometimes these, these thoughts can be overwhelming. You've just got to let them out. You've got to let them out. And then by talking about them with somebody else who hasn't got a vested interest, uh, you'll see more clearly. But you have to be prepared to be vulnerable. The fourth one. Perseverance. When we're on this journey, you can't be measured in months, you can't be measured in years, it's, it's decades. I'm here and it's nearly a decade. I'm not close to the Tokyo store yet. And we only all, all of us only have so many decades available in our lives. In the early days, I didn't think I had the perseverance. Three times in the first few years, I tried to get back into the safety of corporate uh, salary land. Three, three sets of big international brand marketing jobs that were perfect for me on a Nordic level. All three, I desperately tried to get while I'd start, during the time I started my company. All three, I failed to get. And by the third one, I realized somebody's trying to tell me something, and I'm never going to try again. But three times I blinked, because it's easier to give up than it is to carry on. In Finnish, there's a word called sisu, which is one of those famously untranslatable words that represents an entire nation. It means strength in adversity, guts, endurance, perseverance, overcoming all obstacles. After all, they're one of the most advanced societies in the world and they weren't given much up in the far north. Have you got what it takes to persevere? The fifth one. It gets progressively depressing. 
paranoia. Is that product good enough? Did we, uh, did we seriously uh, work uh, the design well enough? Is the wax performing? Does it burn well enough? What's the price point like? Is it a good, right? Is it a good price point in which currency? What's the margin like on that product? Is it going to make us enough money? How much, what volume expectations do we have on it? Do we need, where do we need to support it? Which kind of retailers do we want to work with? Should we work directly? Should we work through distributors? Should we spend more money on marketing, but where are we going to find the money on marketing? How can we get some more money on marketing? Should we maybe get an investor? Maybe we need some investment. But then we might give away some of what, we've, what we strive for, but maybe it's the right thing to do because everybody else is doing that. Is my team working properly? Are they working effectively? Are they motivated? Are they efficient? Have I got too many people? Have I got too few people? Am I working effectively? Am I working efficiently? Am I doing stuff that I should be doing? Am I good enough? Paranoia. It's never going to go away. It's always there. It's always in my head. It will always be in your heads too. And the sixth P, to be honest, is the most cliched of the lot. And I've, def I've honestly, I've tried to find a P because the English language is so good at uh, uh, different options, and I can't. Uh, but just like all five, you have to have it. You have to have it because it's the eternal flame that burns inside you. It's the unlimited battery pack that drives you. It's what gets you up in the morning. It's what motivates you. I absolutely believe the world would be in a much better place if we all lived a bit more Scandinavian. That's not too much to ask. But they're already performing better than the rest of us. Why the hell is nobody listening? I've made it my professional life, my life for the last decade, to try and convince more people to be aware of what Scandinavian living is like and to try to convince them to maybe adapt their, their lifestyles. And through the work we've done with the B Corporation and, and leaving a lighter footprint, I'm trying to walk the talk as well, not just say it, but actually live up to it. Somebody around here wants to make their town making jeans again. It can be very, very personal, and it should be very personal, but you have to absolutely have it. And I'm going to ask the audience what the last P is, and hopefully you'll be able to tell me what it is. Thank you. There you have it, the six Ps of the mind. What's your picture? Does it motivate you? What path are you going to take to get there? And how often, are you, or how, how willing are you to change path? Do you give yourself permission to be vulnerable? Because you'll need to. Have you got what it takes to persevere? Can you handle your paranoia because it's not going to go away? And have you got the passion? I really believe if you can manage your mind, you can manage your business. Thank you. <laughs>